I've been asked to, in 10 minutes, give you an update on a surgical BPH. So I'm really just going to kind of show you where we are and then kind of hit the highlights and try very hard to stay on time. Um, here are my disclosures. I'm going to be talking about uh, Moses technology, and I'm a consultant for Boston Scientific, so that's a relevant disclosure. So, so this is the current state of um, recommendations by the AUA guidelines for the surgical treatment of BPH. And as you all know, it's really based on prostate size um, and uh, algorithmic. And there's lots and lots of options, as you can see. As the prostates get larger, the um, effective options um, decrease. Um, and I think the space for the 30 to 80 cc prostate is where we're seeing a lot of innovation. When we look at national trends in BPH surgical management, this was just uh, published in Urology Practice, you know, showing you all of these resume um, uh, photo vaporization, green light, TERP, Urolift, kind of looking at where we are. This was from 2013 to 2019. In the orange here, you can see, again, TERP still is 40, almost 45% of all the procedures being done in the United States. Um, and the amount of uh, Urolift or prostatic urethral lift that's being done has also increased uh, significantly um, over that time period. Whereas um, green light and photo vaporization of the prostate, which used to be quite a uh, popular procedure, has actually decreased in utilization over time. If we look at this in a different way, um, by examining ABU case logs from 2008 to 2021 and over 6,000 urologists, again, really echoing the same findings where TERP still seems to be the most common procedure done. That's in the blue line here in, in the graph. But one third of the BPH cases in this uh, series was, were prostatic urethral lift. So I think there's definitely an interest in uh, minimally invasive therapies. Um, and if you were going to do a nucleation, we're talking about nucleation a lot here today, um, you tended to be at a high volume center or specialized in endourology. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start from least invasive to most invasive and just give you like little snapshots of what's new or what's different in these different therapies. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the Optolum BPH system. The Pinnacle study was published um, in 2023 by Steve Kaplan's group, Optolum BPH, Paclitaxel coated dilation system. So it's both mechanical um, as well as pharmacologic. The Paclitaxel is anti-proliferative agent. So once you um, have the mechanical dilation, the idea is that the paclitaxel pharmacologically will maintain your luminal patency. Essentially what this balloon is doing in my mind is creating an anterior commissurotomy um, and then delivering the paclitaxel. In this uh, pinnacle study, it was 148 patients randomized two to one optolume to sham uh, with prostates mean size of 45 cc's. And when looking at one year outcomes, there was a mean reduction in IPSS scores of 11 points and QMAX improved 10.3 milliliters per second, which was 125% improvement, with really no impact on erectile or ejaculatory function. And the majority of the adverse events were minor. There were a few patients that had um, hematuria um, and one false passage. And then this data has been updated in the two-year follow-up for Pinnacle. 67.5% of patients still considered to be responders in terms of IPSS score reduction, 23 to 11, and QOL improvements of 4.6 to 2.2 with really maintained flow rates. So, I mean, I think this is, um, you know, not very non-invasive and, um, you know, there, obviously we want to see what the durability is going to be long term, but um, maybe, uh, you know, fits nicely into the armamentarium, particularly for high risk patients. Well, we're at a focal therapy um, meeting, so I feel like we should talk about uh, TULSA, or MRI-guided transurethral ultrasound ablation. This was a phase one study at 12-month outcomes of men that were treated with TULSA for BPH. Um, 10 men treated with prostate volumes of about 50 cc's. Um, the uh, time the procedure took was about 53 minutes, <clears throat> but showed significant improvements in IPSS um, to, from 17 to 4, and QMAX from 12 to 21, with 48% um, prostate volume reduction, which is actually higher than you might seem with green light in the Goliath study. So this um, seems to be uh, potentially uh, um, uh, up and comer. Um, again, no change in continence, sexual or ejaculatory function, and all of these patients discontinued their 
um, medications. So a very small study, but perhaps more to come here. <coughs> well, as I said, we're going to be talking a lot about a nucleation here, so I just put a few additional slides. This is a lot of what I do. I think what we, um, you know, we used to always refer to the energy we're using, hole up, spool up, you know, there's, you name it. But I think you can see by this slide, there's so many different energies you could consider using at this point. Um, and so really what we've done now is come to um, use the terminology anatomic, endoscopic, and nucleation of the prostate. Um, so I think, you know, it's really the premise of removing all the transitional zone, not so much the energy that you're using. Well, when we look at things that have changed in terms of energies that are used, certainly the benefit of using holmium pulse modulation for um, enucleation procedures has been shown in multiple studies to be beneficial. I'm showing you how the laser vapor pulses look different in the regular versus the Moses. It's kind of double bubble phenomenon. The idea is you're getting more energy to the target tissue. We did the first um, prospective double-blind randomized trial looking at MOSES for holmium laser nucleation and saw a benefit in total operative time mostly related to hemostasis. And this has been uh, duplicated by many others. This is a systematic review of meta-analysis of seven studies, over 800 patients, showing shorter enucleation time, shorter operative times, and better hemostasis when you use the MOSES pulse modulation. And the major change, you can say, okay, well, who cares if it's 20 minutes less? The big change was we started sending patients home the same day. And so when you're thinking about, you know, one procedure versus another, you could say, okay, for the ADCC prostate, I could do um, an aqua ablation or I could do a laser enucleation, but who's going home the same day? Right now we have good data for the enucleation patients, and hopefully that'll be up and coming for aqua ablation too. I'm not going to be covering that in too much detail because Dr. Zorn's going to be talking about aqua ablation later. But in this study by Amy Krambeck's group, 87% of patients were able to go home same day after a, a laser nucleation that was using the MOSIS technology. Well, we're going to see in our hands-on lab today the um, thulium fiber laser for nucleation. It's obviously gotten a lot of press for use in stone disease. Um, it has been utilized quite effectively there. Um, this was a study, like most studies for BPH, if you're going to compare yourself, you have to compare yourself to what is uh, considered the gold standard, which in this case is still CHIRP, uh, 50 patients in each group uh, with mean prostate volumes of about 60 cc's. And the surgery time was longer in the thulium fiber laser, but the catheterization and hospital times favored the laser procedure with PSAs being lower, surrogate for how much tissue that's removed, um, and really no difference in functional outcomes. When the um, pulse modulated holmium or MOSES was compared to thulium fiber, again, this is a fairly small study, um, most of the outcomes as far as the nucleation, hemostasis, and more salation times favored the MOSES, um, but really no difference in functional outcomes. I think the other major difference um, in terms of what we're seeing with nucleation is a difference in technique. I'm not going to spend a lot of time right here because I'm going to be giving another talk on this, but I think there's been a move in a nucleation towards on-block techniques, and I'll tell you what the potential benefit of that might be, particularly when we use it with an early apical release. There may be some benefits in um, decreasing the risk of temporary urinary incontinence after a nucleation. While we were talking about aqua ablation, this was a moderated poster presented at the AUA that was comparing aqua ablation to HOLIP for uh, surgical treatment and a meta-analysis of over 2,000 patients. I think the take-home point here is they're very comparable as far as their functional outcomes. Um, HOLIP took a little bit longer as far as operative time, but the catheterization and length of stay was less for HOLIP, as I indicated. Um, but you had a higher risk of uh, urinary incontinence and urethral stricture in the HOLIP group, but a lower surgical retreatment rate. And then finally, um, going again to what I consider most invasive, um, well, what's new in uh, robotic-assisted uh, simple prostatectomy? Well, there's really been a move towards single port. Um, here, I'm just showing you a, a recent series that was published in European Urology, where a single three centimeter suprapubic incision is made using this um, laparoscopic port system to access the bladder. The um, uh, an ad adenoma is nucleated, and then there's a, a fairly um, you know, comprehensive mucosal flap reconstruction. Um, had really quite good outcomes here. Uh, console time about 107 minutes. These were very large prostates, 162 cc's mean. 
um, very low blood loss, um, no transfusions, length of stay, this is a European study, so five days, most of the time that's much less in the United States, um, and catheters for about three days. But this is my take on point. When I think about who I do an enucleation for versus who I send for a robotic simple, two patients in this group had air emboli, had a serious complication of this procedure. So I, th I think you have to think about the fact that it is a more invasive procedure and, and whether it's, the patient is best suited with that. So in conclusion, I think this is a field that's really ripe with innovation. Um, there's no one here is going to tell you that the procedure they do the most is right for every patient because it is not. Um, you really need to match the best treatment with the patient's decisions and wishes, the shared decision making as we like to call it. But I want to remind everyone, I mean, when we think about BPH, mostly what we're doing is we're trying to improve quality of life. Um, and so you really have to think about side effect profiles and how the, um, how the patient feels about each and every one of those. So thank you. Very appreciate that.